Well, my name is Stu Abramson. I'm the president of the society here, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event. Uh, what we're going to do is kind of legitimize things a little bit before we let you loose again and uh, explain pretty much what we're doing here and what, why we're here. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is explain this lectern. This is the historical society, as you, as you already know. And so this is our latest uh, acquisition, which is uh, about a week or so old, last week. This was donated by an anonymous donor to us. It is a lectern, as you see it says 1922 on there. This very lectern was part of the Doylestown High School the one that was built in 1890 and burned down in, it was destroyed in a fire in 1972-1973 uh, time frame. Um, so we don't know the story of this thing yet, but uh, what we do know is that this was donated by the class president of the class of 1922. His name is was Fred Martin, the son of Oscar Martin who was a noted architect in town for a very long time. So he, as president of the class of 1922, donated this lectern. His son, also named Fred Martin, is still with us. He's 85, 86 years old. I spoke with him last week. Unfortunately, he's unable to attend because this would have been a great photo op, but we will get him here and, and uh, take that picture. <clears throat> so that's the story of that. All right, the business at hand. 50 years ago, Doylestown was at a crossroads. The, the downtown area was uh, deteriorating pretty good because of a combination of the shopping center north of town, suburban sprawl, and things of that nature. And there was programs available, urban renewal type programs by the federal government. And so money was on the table for the town to fix things up. And a lot of meetings and a lot of pushing and shoving and elbowing. And in the end, the borough decided not to accept federal money, but to do it themselves, which is what they did. Um, and by doing so, they preserved the historical essence of this town, along with its charm. In that process, which was a lot more complicated than I'm kind of making it out to be, three leaders emerged, three. One was Joe Kenny, who was the owner of Kenny's Bookstore, who most, if not all of you know. Another was Frank Shelley, who had a, an insurance company in town. And the third one was a commercial artist who they uh, engaged to be part of this crowd. His name is Bill Irwin, was Bill Irwin. All three are now deceased. So I, I mention that now, and I'm going to come back to those three people in a little while, if you bear with me. But suffice it to say at this time, just to summarize things, here with the 50-year perspective that we have now, and after the town center business section is listed in the National Register, and as you probably are aware, there's multiple national magazines that designated Doylestown, the cent Doylestown Center, or Doylestown itself, as being one of the best places in this country to live or to visit. So that is kind of testament to the fact that the decisions that were made in 1964 were the correct ones. <clears throat> and, and it is certainly altogether fitting then that we take this, this opportunity that we have right now to stop and commemorate the work that was done by the borough and in particular the three leaders at that time. So without further ado, we have a, uh, just a few people that are going to say some things, and we're going to lead off with the mayor of this fair town, Mayor Ron Strauss.
to do without this. And I have to tell you that I appreciate Stu's acknowledgement at this podium because I didn't want anyone to be confused that I had some association <laughs> with the class of 1922. Um, a few weeks ago, I had an opportunity to talk with a group of high school students from Central Bucks West that are graduating uh, in the next week or so. And uh, they're studying our local institutions uh, and how they work. And they take their inspiration from, I think, a rather well-known quote from Margaret Mead that goes, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. In part, I spoke to them about Operation 64 as, as an example of that quote in action. I spoke about its importance to our community and how it fits into the, what I think is the exceptionalism of our community. Uh, it represents a bootstraps operation. It represents cooperation and determination between the private sector, government, and our residents as well. And while some of the effort that preceded Operation 64 also involved that kind of cooperation, it really is Operation 64 that gave it a, a renewed focus in our borough. The three year leaders that we honor showed a recognition of our unique history, of our architecture, and even our physical beauty at the same time. And they showed extraordinary leadership in responding to a very serious economic emergency. But we continue to enjoy their accomplishments. And we continue to exercise a lot of their good practices. Uh, the message of history is, I think, a living message. There exists a usually good cooperation in Doylestown between and among the residents, the business community, and local government. We have a re revitalization board that is charged with carrying on the legacy of Operation 64. We have a historical society that grounds our current success in our rich history. So, so the importance of Operation 64 cannot be underplayed. The importance uh, is visible every day in our wonderful borough. And uh, Margaret Mead's message was brought to life by Operation 64 and lives on in Doylestown today. Thanks very much. Um, at this time, even though these gentlemen I don't think are here, I would like to acknowledge the work of the township borough manager, I should say, John Davis, and the assistant borough manager and public works manager, Phil Erlinger. The borough has supported the society very well over the last several years, and we are most appreciative of that. And as far as Phil Erlinger goes, it was probably he, more than anyone else, who was the inspiration to us, our committee that put this event together and this exhibit together, because of Phil's knowledge of Operation 64 and his passion a little of which you heard Mayor Strauss talk about. And the other thing that uh, Ron Strauss did talk about, and I'll just uh, latch on to that a little bit, is that the uh, many people think that the lasting legacy of Operation 64 is, as Ron mentioned, the working together of the residents, the merchants, and the municipal government that we have here. I mean, it seems like a really nice, cohesive group that makes things work around here. And so representing the government portion of that uh, three-legged stool, I'd like to present the president of Borough Council, Ben Anson. Thank you, Stu, and to the Historical Society for really bringing recognition to something that you know, we've known and appreciated and benefited from throughout the years. Uh, my name is Dead Anson. I'm Council President of Doylestown Borough. On behalf of the whole council, we're proud to support the Doylestown Historical Society's recognition of Operation 64. As someone who went to school here locally, someone who graduated from the West, I was long familiar with Operation 64 before I even um, ran for local elected office. And 
understanding this stewardship we have in this community, this legacy of the, activi the activism that took place back in 1964, which helped preserve our downtown. It's the kind of thing that we look at when we make decisions in our own borough, as, as we have technology and modernization and these things taking place, that we never forget or lose the character of the community, the community that we grew up in, the character of the community that I'm raising my own children in. It's something of an actionable legacy. And it's one thing to say, OK, yes, a particular building was preserved, a particular piece of architecture was preserved. But the kind of relationship, the kind of uh, experience that we have here between our retailers, between our local government, and between the people who make up this wonderful community is truly the legacy of Operation 64. And I think the Margaret Mead quote definitely dresses that well. But we still are a community here that even on a Sunday uh, afternoon, with it being about 80 some odd degrees, that we all come out to recognize this great history of town. And I'm proud that we can all be a part of it. Thank you very much to the Historic Gold Society. Thank you, Stu. Short and sweet, right? Just like we want. So, so far, two people have alluded to this quote from Margaret Mead, which essentially says that all good things happen from just a very few passionate individuals. And Margaret Mead came up with that quote long before 1964, but we are certain it applies to the three leaders of Operation 64 uh, that, we, that we talked about. And um, those are the people that kind of made Operation 64 happen. Uh, just to add to the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, because Doylestown during that time turned down federal money, <coughs> Excuse me. At a time when nobody was leaving money on the table, this town did. And it took, I guess, a little bit of courage, if that's the right word, to do that, but more passion and belief that they can do it, we can do it on our own. Uh, and, and they did. And because Doylestown turned down money at that time, the story went national. And by national, I mean pretty soon during that year or shortly thereafter, those three leaders uh, were inundated with requests from around this country to visit them and to spread the story of how Operation 64 became successful while turning down federal money. So they hit the road. I think the two people who actually did hit the road were Frank Shelley and Joe Kenny, while Bill was staying around doing his sketching and raising family and whatnot. But, uh, what they did is, what they left, I should say, is a suitcase, a luggage suitcase, full of, full of stuff, pictures, newspaper clippings, and the works, in addition to a portfolio which had all of Bill Irwin's sketches and photos that were taken during the time. Well, those artifacts found their way to us um, here, and that was what was used to create the exhibit that we now have in that room, and which I would encourage you to go visit. And if you can't do it today, you know, this uh, house will be open uh, until 4 o'clock. But we are open to the public uh, every Saturday. We certainly encourage you to come and take a look if you haven't had a chance to, to see it today. But um, <clears throat> I do want to acknowledge that even though the uh, the original people, Joe, Frank, and Bill Irwin, could not be here with us today. Their family members are, and that is ter terrific. And so I would just like to acknowledge the presence of Dick Dommel, who is the son-in-law of uh, Joe Kenny, and uh, <clears throat> Frank Shelley III, right there. Uh, the number of his family members, and, and I, I, I want to make sure that I remember that Mrs. Shelley is here with us, 94, or soon to be 94 years old, bless her heart, is here, with a smiling face. And the last member of the triumphant is uh, Nathan Irwin who traveled the longest distance, I think, to come here. He traveled from Maryland, is it? Uh, Virginia. Virginia, even further. Uh, but who's counting? <laughs> and Nathan has some remarks. 
Thank you, Stu. True to form for Bill Irwin, the back of an envelope. <laughs> Bill Irwin loved history. He loved the history of the United States and all its facets. The Native Americans, the Europeans who came over to settle and move west. For those of you who knew my father, he was involved in the centennial Civil War reenactments. He really loved history. He dragged me into the bicentennial revolutionary reenactments as he played the drum and I played the fife. Anyway, but he also loved Bucks County. It's where he, grew, he was born, grew up, and lived his life. Uh, he was born in Abington Hospital, grew up around Doylestown uh, in, on various farms, um, had two wonderful sisters who I consider my aunts, uh, Ellen Clark and Janice Allen. And uh, then after time, I guess, getting out of Buckingham High School, he went into the Air Force, uh, went to Massachusetts, on to Montana, was gone for several years uh, in the early, the late 40s and a good part of the 50s, and came back, got his degree at the Philadelphia College of Art, and finally, with my mother, settled down at 36 Bridge Street, that way. I lived Operation 64 because 36 Bridge Street turned into a microcosm of Operation 64. It was a big old, still is, Edwardian house built around 1900. It needed a lot of work. And it also needed not only refurbishing and renovating, but modernizing. And I remember uh, the process took about 10 years. And during that time, Operation 64 unfolded uh, from my father's perspective in the attic studio. And I remember going up, looking at probably the illustrations that we're going to see inside on display, hearing the conversations around the dinner table about Frank Shelley and Joe Kenny and, uh, and all of that. And, and, uh, and while my sister was jumping up and down saying, it's 1964, we have to watch the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Um, <clears throat> but it was an integral part of my father's life and his colleagues' life. Um, they helped spearhead the effort, but so many other people worked, and I don't even know who the people are, because in 64, I was only six years old. But people continue to work on this. So Operation 64, in my opinion, is really not over. Um, it's just ongoing. I, I jogged down to Bridge Street to take a look, and what my father had done to the house, other people have built on and done other interesting things, and I see this around town. And I just, uh, I can safely speak on behalf of uh, the, all the Irwin family who are here in Pennsylvania, Montana, Virginia, wherever, we are, are deeply honored and moved and greatly appreciate your celebrating what Bill Irwin did in collaboration with uh, uh, Frank Shelley and Joe Kenny. Thank you. Very good. So you may have noticed that uh, around town, we're commemorating not only Operation 64, but we are also commemorating what is being called uh, um, Art Days, Doylestown Art Days. <laughs> And uh, which has been going on since Thursday. So essentially, the town of Doylestown has been turned into one big art gallery, as near as we can tell. And so I would like to acknowledge the person who has been the leader of that event, and it is Stephanie Lyle, who is right here. Uh, <clears throat> We got to work with Stephanie in conjunction with the Operation 64 commemoration, and I can tell you she's a joy to work with. I mean, she's one of these people who gets things done, and uh, we really appreciate that, and I would certainly encourage you to visit her shop, her gallery, at, on, on Ashland Street, and it is called? Bucks County Project Gallery. Bucks County Project Gallery. Very good. Uh, uh, Doylestown Art Days was done under the auspices of the Doylestown, and here again I need some help, Doylestown Business and Community Alliance. I think that's the, the current yeah. name for the next 20 minutes at least. And, and, um, and the effort, I, the next speaker I think is going to tell you about the effort, so rather than me try, I'm going to introduce to you the, 
the president, the current president of the DBCA, Mike Kendrick. Hi. Um, I remember back in January, um, I was at a meeting of the Doylestown Merchants, which is now called Discover Doylestown, and Stephanie brought up her brilliant idea. None of us knew what was going to take off. A couple galleries, I think we met at her shop, between all the snowstorms we had. It was sort of crazy. And um, I came to a meeting then that Stu called for Operation 64 and had no idea what that was. Sitting there, we found out it was the same time. And there's always tons of events going on at the same time. We said, why don't we merge these events, have them benefit from each other? At the same time, I learned more about Operation 64 and said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to be here because these gentlemen saved this town the way it is because I lived in a town called Lancaster, Pennsylvania that took the money. And our first 100 block of Queen Street got tore down. It was a concrete monstrosity right now. Half of it's gone. The other half is actually being fixed as I speak. And that, so they took the money and made a big mistake. Thank you, Doylestown, those people who took the, didn't take the money and we're at where we're at today. Um, we merged these two events so that they could actually benefit each other and we'll keep doing this each year. Um, I think we've had, what, about 70 businesses involved, 30 events for Arts Days. There's exhibits inside, artists outside. Next year we're gonna continue this even though we don't have Operation 64 this year. We're going to do more things that will become a tradition, like we do our flower baskets every year. Santa Claus is coming to town. I think last year we had a Hanukkah song fest. We have our arts festival. So the business community is thankful for the people that saved the town and made it a great place to live, visit, and shop. Thank you. Well, okay, so we're moving right along here, and at this time there is a number of people I would like to acknowledge if you would bear with me, and I'm going to refer to my notes just to make sure that I do not forget anybody, which is not really a guarantee in itself. But I'd like to start with Marilyn Arbor, Valerie Higgins, and Carol Hessler sitting over there. <clears throat> Uh, those ladies were the curators of the exhibit. That means that they spent all the hours going through the suitcase that I mentioned earlier, picking out the appropriate pieces, whether they be photos or newspaper clippings, and putting them in order, and putting them up on our exhibit board, which we absolutely encourage you to visit, if not today, to come back and, and do it some other time, because it gives you the history that we don't even have the time to go into about the effort that those three gentlemen went through to make that happen. And while I'm doing that, I want to acknowledge the work of Paul Boger, who is standing right there. <coughs> Paul, uh, Paul Boger, Boger attended one of the merchant meetings that Mike Henrik just mentioned here and just stepped up and said, I want to be a part of this. And he runs a photo shop in town called Mind Your Design, Mind Your Design, which we also encourage you to visit. And uh, he went around with Marilyn and uh, looked at the old sketches that Bill Irwin had done and took modern day pictures from the same, same angle. You know, so that you can see the vision that Bill Irwin had, some of the old photos from that era, and see them as they are currently viewed right now. So thank you very much for your help. <clears throat> David and Jean Lostin, who I do not see here, are our videographers. Um, and the reason I mention that is because in addition to the exhibit that we have inside, we also did a video, a roundtable discussion involving a number of people who were long-term residents of Doylestown or long-term merchants of Doylestown. And they sat up in our Holloway gallery upstairs in the barn and videoed their reminiscences about life in Doylestown in the 1960s and how it is today. So we have that video playing both in the barn and in the front room, the reception room of the house uh, on a continuous loop, I hope. Uh, so you're certainly welcome to uh, watch at least a portion of, of that. 
Um, and so that was the work, the handiwork of Gene and David Alostin. Tom Brunt, Tom Brunt, who is standing right there uh, with his iPad in motion, is our social media guy. And Tom just does a terrific job. Uh, I don't know if this is a Facebook and Twitter crowd I'm addressing here, but you know, if you look at our website, you can access our Facebook site, and there's a pretty good chance you'll see yourself on the internet <laughs> later this evening. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, coming down the home stretch here is uh, I want to just acknowledge our musicians, the um, Jim, the Holton LeBlanc duo, cello and flute. Thank you very much, Jim and Cindy. Uh, they, uh, you, you add a touch of class to the proceedings, no question. Thank you. And also to our ice cream lady, Danielle of Sweet Pea up there. You know, it's a hot day. I'm sure you can use some ice cream. And so, uh, so with that, uh, if I have forgotten anybody, I don't know. Uh, if I have, Bill, let me know. Uh, I, I have forgotten somebody, of course. Uh, I typically do. I'd like to acknowledge Fletcher Walls and, and Milt Kennan sitting here. And the reason I, I tend to forget them is because they're here all the time and work tirelessly to make events like this happen behind the scenes. But, you know, it's important to acknowledge their, their good work. Milk and, and pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, well, that's pretty much uh, our, our program. The exhibit will stay up, as I mentioned, for most of the balance of the year. Uh, I would encourage you to visit us. I would even more so encourage you to become a member of the Doylestown Historical Society. It's, we're talking 30, 35 bucks a year. It's not a big deal. Uh, we are a nonprofit. We live from donations. I don't mean to give you our, our uh, viewers like you, uh, you know, <laughs> Channel 12 uh, <laughs> approach, but, <laughs> but you're, you're a great audience member, Dick, I gotta tell you. Um, uh, a reminder that one of the programs that we have on a continual basic basis is our walking tours. And so that generally happens uh, one Saturday a month, but the next one will be next Saturday at 11 o'clock. We kind of got fouled up a little bit with newspaper articles and whatnot uh, this uh, past uh, week, but I wanted to let everybody know that that program will resume at 11 o'clock next Saturday. So with that, uh, I encourage you to, to walk around, enjoy yourself, buy some ice cream, and uh, we'll see you at the next event. Thank you very much for coming.